are we? Who am, am I? Who am I? Am I my name, Adam? Well, yes, right? that's how people refer to me. Right? Am I a, a pastor? Absolutely. Am I a parent? Yes, I am. Yes, I am a, a husband. And, I, and this and that, I have different hobbies, different interests. I am a follower of, of Jesus. And so we have these different things that can make up our identity, but we, we live in a day and a time where I've just sensed a, uh, a level of uh, great confusion, I guess would be the best word, of who we, of who we are, of what makes us who we are. And with that confusion brings about instability for, for, for one, and it brings about uh, um, con- confusion and, and uh, different types of, uh, of things. But in particularly, my concern is for, one, us as believers, do we know who we are for our church? What does our church say as far as who we are, and then how do we convey that message in the way that that Jesus would have us do so in a world that, uh, to be honest, is just a lot of, uh, I guess anger would be the best word, the, the division, again, and, and with that, just the, uh, the, the, the yelling, I guess, the goals. And, and so with that is how do we convey that message in a loving and a, a caring way that, that, that conveys that, that this is not just what we think today or maybe we change tomorrow, or, but it is grounded in something that has, has never changed. And, uh, and so over these next few weeks, we're going to look at, um, at our identity, and I say particularly um, in regards to, to sexual identity. And, um, and I'm going to, what my prayer has been over these last um, weeks and months, that uh, one that I do it justice that anything that I, I, I preach, it comes from the Word of God. It's not a, a political belief of mine or as though the way and a philosophy that I think the world should be uh, this way, but it is uh, truly through the Holy Spirit that I am just the, the vessel here. And honestly, it's something that I've kind of just kind of stayed away from because it can be controversial. And, um, and I'm not one... I, you know, if it needs to be, we'll, we'll deal with it, but I don't really go looking for it. But over the last, gosh, I don't know, several, a uh, couple of months, I've had uh, people outside of the church kind of ask me, he's like, well, how, where, where does your church stand on this deal of, 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 of gay marriage? And, um, and so I, you know, answered the, the question as, um, as I can. But um, my guess is, is that if I'm getting that question here in Maysville, Kentucky. You probably are too. And maybe you even have questions about, you know, what is this? And then even more so, how do we, you know, how do we share what we believe in a way that is godly, in a way that is, we say, edifying, building another, another up? And so we're going to kind of, kind of start today. Then next week, um, we're going to be in Father's Day. We are going to look at how do we parent in an age that we're, we're in uh, today. And then, um, then we're going to look at some of the challenges that, that the church also faces. And it's called this kind of this moral revolution that, that, we, are, that we are in. And, and I speak of this um, moral revolution in you know, if you, you watch the, the news or, you know, see, you're, we're kind of bombarded with these, these different messages. And as 
you're probably aware June is uh, known as, as Pride Month. Um, and I, I mean, I always was aware of it and kind of its origins uh, going back to the uh, to, to 1969 and to the uh, the Stonewall riots up in up in New York City, and then the parades came from that, and the the rainbow flag came uh, from uh, from that. But uh, this year is the first, at least just in my own perception, that could be off, but is it just seems like it's everywhere. <laughs> You look on Facebook and you see the the circle with the you know the different colors or uh, and I knew it when I turned on our you know TV and Hulu's got you know the background and Netflix and and it's and it's just it's um, very front and center uh, this uh, this this year and uh, and and you know the first question I had is how did this all you know how did we go from what was you know always a thing but now it's it's not only the accepted thing, but really it is the, that if, if you're not a part of it, then really you're the, uh, the one that's in the wrong. And um, uh, uh, Dr. Almola, president of Southern Seminary, has um, written a lot on culture issues. And uh, one thing, he, he, he talks about the, um, how cultural uh, change happens. And what happens is, at first, what was once seen as wrong out of of the norm, and then we have what is right. So you have the right and the and the wrong. And then the next phase of a of a a moral revolution is is then is the acceptance is what was considered wrong, right? And we we you know have seen this from in in years past on. The, the the homosexual lifestyle. It's a, you know, what does that have to do with us? You know, why why does it matter? Just let them just let love be be love, and and you know we can just kind of live our own separate ways. And then and so we have that. So what was wrong was uh, right and wrong. Then what was wrong is accepted. So we're kind of on neutral terms. But then we we see on the next phase of it, which is where I believe. We may not fully be there, but we're getting to that point is what was once seen right is now seen wrong. Uh, and so in, in the case of, let's say, you know, the um, gay marriage, for example, all right, you know, it's always been around relationships, even we'll see in Scripture that it has been. But even before then, we, um, in, in recent, you know, decades, um, that it has become more and more prevalent. So it was started what was wrong. In fact, we even had laws against it in years past or certain actions. And, um, and, and then what was wrong now was, was just there. It's like, hey, you know, it just you do you and we'll do me. You know, it's just kind of let's just live and let, let live and agree to disagree. And, and now we've, we've shifted to where since the, the Obergefell decision of the Supreme Court where gay marriage was um, legalized is now if you're not affirming of it, uh, then you are doing wrong, you're doing harm. And in some ways, other vulgar words have been used to accuse uh, Christians and others that have differing views. Now, that's not to say that we're innocent on that, sadly, Many Christians in engaging with others have have earned that that title, and we'll look at that um, in in time to come. But but we've seen this this moral revolution, and and I be, kind of became really aware it's hit home for uh, for me when uh, you know a couple of months ago we we saw that our one of our Kentucky Baptist entities, Sunrise Children's Services, was. Um, is one of the largest providers of child care, um, foster and adoption care services in the state. Um, and we've been that way since the 1800s. And um, when the, the state of Kentucky came to the, the KBC to Sunrise, the children's home back in those days, as it was known, um, they said, we need help. Can you help us? Can you partner with us to, to take on more children? And yeah, it's like, well, sure, these are the... And, and so that relationship not only worked, it just it grew and grew to where Sunrise um, 
uh, is done a lot of good for the, the, the vulnerable children in our society. And then we see this year that, uh, that now the state has chosen not to renew its contract that we have had since the 70s. And there's different statements made by the governor and uh, the administration as to um, why that has. And I just noticed that the, the dishonesty in the media and how they have, have reported that, but also just it kind of confirms that in certain statements that have been, that have been made. And, and, and so we're seeing now that the state is, for the time being, we'll see how it shakes out, but it said that, uh, look, unless you would agree to place children with couples that are living a homosexual lifestyle, then you can no longer be a part, uh, or we can no longer partner with each other. And, uh, you know, on one sense, we understand, you know, the separation of, of, of church and state, and that's going to be in our, we're looking at our religious uh, uh, freedom message and those challenges we face. But, um, but it was more the statement that, that the governor kind of made, and it was that, you know what, I just don't understand why we wouldn't place these children with any loving couple that, and those that are in a gay, gay marriage, place them there. And, and on one hand, that's, that's not the opposite of what Sunrise is doing, right? We do have a deeply held religious belief, right? And, and, and so with that, it is, um, we're just not going to compromise on on that. So we are protected under the First Amendment of the Constitution with that. But, but this is where the moral revolution has, has come, come, come about, is, is now we have said that, that, look, we're on the wrong side of history when we reject that. But what Sunrise says, and, and I love how their president put it, he said, look, we, first, we care for any child, regardless of their race, ethnicity, uh, gender, fluidity, how that is, sexual orientation. Look, the children, we're going to care for them no matter who they are. Now, at the same time, we also have deeply held religious beliefs, and there are some people that we're just not able to serve. But in that, we provide them up to go to another organization or send them to the state who will place them the best place that they can. But that's, that's where the, re- the moral revolution has gone. That's kind of the second phase. Now we're in the third phase, where if you don't buy in, then you're kicked out. And I don't know where things will end with that, but we continue to, um, to, to pray uh, that uh, God would be at, at work. But in this confusion, I think it's important for us to want to kind of clear up some things and understand why we think the way we do, why we believe the things that, that we, we do to be able to have a a inadequate answer to be able to give a defense for why we believe. And it's not based on what we feel. It's not even based on what society says. It is based on who God is and what he has said to us. And in some ways, it's kind of the same as, as scripture uh, as, or as our message series in, in worship. Um, but one of the things that we can do is, is, is we have to go back to God's Word. And I think a helpful a definition uh, of what we believe about the Bible comes from our Baptist faith and message. Um, and it's this, that the Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It is God for its author salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Now, others would, would, a term that theologians use for this is the inerrancy of the Bible without error, and means that we can trust the Bible is absolutely true. It says, therefore, right, all Scripture is totally true and trustworthy, and it reveals the principles by which God judges us, and therefore is and will remain to the end of the world, the true center of Christian union, and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. All Scripture is a testimony to Christ, who is himself the focus of divine revelation. 
A couple of other words that help kind of uh, just uh, kind of firm up this statement from the Baptist faith of of message. Another one is is the uh, the clarity of Scripture. All right, we believe that that the Bible is not just for. Uh, uh, those that are, you know, the intellectuals or those that are, 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 are clergy, as it was in previous years, if you were, um, and, and in part, that's, if you look at, at a lot of the history of the world, where a lot of the greatest literacy came about was through Christians. Because of the importance of being able to read God's word, we thought that reading is, is important. So it's, it's the clarity that anybody can, uh, can read it and, and, and understand it. Now, obviously, we, there's parts of the Bible that are easier to understand than other parts. But, uh, but it is clear in what we need to know. Like what Pastor Tim Kell, retired pastor now, which says that the Bible tells us everything we need to know. But here's the kicker. It doesn't tell us everything we want to know. It tells us everything we need to know, but it doesn't tell us what, maybe what we want to know. And another word is, that helps us to, um, to, to get, to get um, um, understand Scripture and where I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm coming from is um, the uh, sufficiency of Scripture. All right, so we, you know, you heard that, you know, the, the Bible is kind of our, our guidebook or, or, or playbook. Right? And, and it's not 100% Accurate. It's, it is that. It's more than that. But it is sufficient for everything that we need. And so it should be our primary source of, of how we live, of what we believe, and, 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 and how we engage with, with those that are, that are around us. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't learn from other things such as science or history or outside biblical sources. I think there's a uh, um, good but. This is the kicker if we believe in the inerrancy of God's word is that those things cannot contradict, cannot contradict Scripture. So the, the starting point for us is the very word of, of God. Now, I would encourage you, you can go on the SBC's website and find this. Don't just take what a committee wrote. No, it is rooted in, in Scripture and search the Scriptures for yourself. But, but one of those, and I've mentioned it a lot, and it's because it is important, but it's from 2 Timothy. Paul says this, And now from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, the Word of God, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Here's all Scripture, right, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 21 is, is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So all of Scripture is breathed out by God. It is His work through divine inspiration, through the work of human men, but it is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in, in righteousness. So what I want us to do in the last minutes that we have is to, what does the Bible say? Not what the news stations say, or not what um, social media says, or not what our uncle says at family dinners, but what does the Bible say about who we are? Well, to know that, we must go back to the uh, to the very beginning. And so we, uh, we see uh, this here in the book of, of Genesis, uh, chapter 1. So God has created the heavens, He's created the earth, and then He, he comes to, now it's the time to create humans. And He said, then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, over, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, God created man in his own image. The image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. So we know ultimately that we are created by by God. 
They didn't. We were not a matter of transforming from another organism. No, it was that God, God breathed into man and, and gave him life. And, and we know he took a bone from, from Eve and the bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. And, and Eve, the man, was a helper for Adam. But God created them, right? Male and female. It continues on um, um, here in, uh, in Genesis. And uh, it says, God blessed them. And he said, be fruitful and multiply the earth and fill, or, and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So not only did God create them, but he gave them a command, a couple of commands, Right? The first one was to be fruitful and multiply. We call this procreation, right? That's how you got here. That's how I got here. We did not create ourselves. But not only that, but we are to have dominion over the earth. We're to be stewards to care for and to nurture and to, to nurture the earth. So we see that God created Adam and Eve created them male and female. He commanded them to, to be fruitful, to multiply the earth. They had, uh, they had sons and their offspring continued down to where all of us are here to today. So we see that our identity is at the highest level is rooted in God's creation. And we know, because we haven't hit Genesis 3 yet, that God's creation was good. It was the way things were supposed to be before sin entered into the world. So what we see in the beginning of the Scripture is the way that it should be, male and female and Continuing on again before Genesis 3, but we, we see this in Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 2 uh, here. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And so we see that the, the Scripture tells us, uh, this is God speaking the way things were supposed to be before sin entered the world, that man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his, his wife. And so this, in part, with some other passages, it leads us to what the, our Baptist faith and, and message says about, um, about the family. It says that God has ordained the family as the foundational institution of human society, it is composed of persons related to one another by marriage, blood, or adoption. Marriage is the uniting of one man to one woman in covenant commitment for a lifetime. It is God's unique gift to reveal the union between Christ and his church to provide for the man and the woman in marriage the framework of intimate companionship, the channel of sexual expression according to biblical standards, and the means of procreation for the human race. So this is what God says about who we are and, and how we are to marry and also how we are to procreate. Now, one of the objections that, that we might hear is, and we um, disagree with those, but um, understand where there is that, well, that's the Old Testament, or some might even reject the, um, the historicity of, of the Garden of, of Eden, that it's just, you know, an example for, for people to, to follow. Um, I believe in a, a literal uh, Garden of Eden and a literal Adam and, and Eve. But, you know, some, and even some pastors will say, well, look, this is 2021. We, the Old Testament just really doesn't have much to say about times that we're in right now. We, you know, if we really want to, um, if we really want to, to, to get to the, the people where they are, we need to unhitch the church from the Old Testament and just, just stick with the New Testament. 
Now, I disagree with that statement uh, wholeheartedly too. Why? Because, well, the writers of the New Testament believed in the Old Testament for much of what they wrote referred back to the Old Testament. But also, as we saw in 2 Timothy, it said, just the New Testament is breathed out by God, right? No. All Scripture is breathed out by God. But if we, you know, accepted those those arguments, you know, we could um, go to the, the the New Testament and 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 see there, and uh, and um, and here's actually one that is uh, from from Jesus Himself. Jesus said, He answered, "Have you not read that He who created them from the beginning made them male and female?" And He said, "Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh." So they were no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, right? Marriage, that's what marriage is. It's not just signing a contract. It's not just, you know, saying, hey, man, we're just going to stay here together as long as things are good, you know. We'll just figure this thing out. No, marriage is, God has joined it together. He said, let not man Separate. These are the words of Jesus. And, and, and sometimes we'll, we'll have people that will refer, well, you know, we just need to stick with what Jesus said. You know, he didn't speak about homosexuality or, or gay marriage. And, um, and, and so he, I mean, he didn't actually say the words, thou shalt not, you know, uh, marry a man, man with a man or a woman with a woman. But, I mean, we can read the context here. But also, I mean, we can't make that statement because... Even John himself said that if he wrote everything that Jesus said and did, it would be volume upon volume. We don't know what Jesus said that is not necessarily in Scripture. And so we see the example from creation, the order that God created. Also, we see the teaching of of Jesus. But we also see that Paul is probably the the, the author, the apostle that that wrote... um, I would say probably most pointedly about the issues that we face to today in the book of Romans chapter 1. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, they, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, and malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of, of evil, Disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they do not only do them, but give approval to those who who practice them. Paul also says this in his letter to the Corinthians. He says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? But do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, well, Paul is pretty, um, just lays it right out there. Uh, now, as we read in Scripture and, and interpret Scripture, as I always say, we, context is important. And especially in the letters, it was written to a specific people at a specific time. Okay, so so Paul was speaking to the situation. These acts were happening at the time that Paul wrote them in the city of Rome and in, in the city of Corinth. And not just that, but these letters were not written to those outside of the church. They were written to the church themselves. And so Paul says, look... This is wrong, and you can't keep doing it if you want to enter the kingdom of God. Now, that brings another question that we might say is, can you, can you be a, a Christian and live this type of, 
of lifestyle. Now we see that he lumped you know, sexual sin with that of disobeying parents, idolatry. Basically, he went through the Ten Commandments. And honestly, if we're all um, honest with us, you know, we, we've committed some of those sins. Um, if not, we have that pet sin, at least you know, here or there. So does that mean that we can't enter the kingdom of God? And I would respond in in a couple of ways uh, to that. Um, You know, first is that salvation is not based on who we're married to. It's not based on really who we're attracted to. It's not based on where we live. Honestly, it's not based on anything other than our faith and trust in Jesus as our Savior and Lord. Right, sadly, there are, I haven't seen it, but just looking at things, there's a lot of straight people that are likely in hell. I don't say that with any arrogance. It breaks my heart. I say that anyone would enter hell. But, but our orientation, and that, that, does, that has nothing to do with, our, we must have our faith and trust in, in Christ. Now, the other question that I would you know, kind of pose is that can you be a Christian and, and live these, this way? And right, we know, right, we all still sin, do we not? Yeah, we all, we all still sin. So what's wrong with this sin versus that sin? And in some ways there's a lot of things wrong, right? You murder somebody, you're going to get a different earthly punishment than if you tell a lie to your parents, hopefully. If not, the parents are going to get into to some, uh, uh, some issues there. Um, but uh, but, but um, and so the, we have the, the, the consequence aspect. But this is, you know, the kind of how I would respond to that is we know that Jesus taught, was those about, who said that that's how we live is a matter of the heart. Right? So, you know, they said, well, I've never murdered anybody. He says, if you had anger in your towards your brother, then you've committed murder in your own heart. Or like, I've never committed adultery. Well, if you've lusted after a woman, then you've committed adultery in your heart. And so I would say, is where is your heart? Yes, we sin, but are you consumed with that, that sin? Do you love that sin? Is it you, the uh, feed it? Do you allow it to, to grow in you? Or do you, you see it, you repent and you, and, and, you, and you continue to, to work through the power of the Holy Spirit to be sanctified. And, and so I can't say for absolute certain because I am not God. I cannot look into a person's heart. All we can do is see the fruit that one has. But there's one of the dangers that we face in the church uh, today is that is this idea, and maybe it's just avoidance, and look, I get it. I, sadly, I do it a lot. Um, or or it, maybe it's honestly just not really understanding the, the, um, um, what the Bible is, is saying, but you know, probably I'd say the, often the most misquoted verse in all of the Bible is, is Matthew 7, verse 1. You know it. It's, Judge not that you be not judged. And so in today's society, that is interpreted as saying, well, I should never tell anybody that what they do is wrong, right? Because I do wrong myself. Right? And I mean, I get that. I mean, that makes us uncomfortable because we don't think. And, and, and I said that's good because it sees some humility in us, right? First and foremost, we're better than nobody, anybody, right? As the Apostle Paul says, I am the worst, the chief of sinners, and he's probably the greatest missionary the world has ever known. If he's that, who do you think we are? But judge not that you not be judged does not mean that we affirm everything that a person does. One is just proper understanding of this of the passage, the context that it is 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 in for in fact Jesus continues on later and says you know what you need to pull the plank out of your eye first so that you can help others to be able to see the sin that's in theirs and so but also I think a way it just helped me to kind of grasp this is that judge can mean different things 
Right? In one sense, yes, it is, a, it is a pronouncement of condemnation. Right? You're guilty of a crime, and the, the, the jury brings the verdict, and then the judge sentences you, right? He condemns you to a punishment. And he is the authority to do that. Well, friends, you nor I nor any human is the authority to condemn anyone. The Bible says that is for God and God alone. But judge also has a different, can be used in a different sense, meaning to be wise or to be discerning or to, to doing what is right. Those of us that are, or parents, either you have grown children or you've got young ones, you hope that, that they have good judgment, do you not? You want them to be wise in the choices that they make, discerning in the people that they choose to, to be with. And do you just say, well, look, hey, you know what, judge not, that you be judge, hey, look, I, you do whatever you, you want to do, regardless of it. I mean, that, I mean, logically, that's the same line that we're taking. No. We as believers in Christ should lovingly, all right, we should speak truth in love, but we should seek that, that others would see the ways that is right. And how do we know that? We must ourselves be in, in the word of God. So as we, as we, we, we see here, and, and we're going to unpack it even more in, in the weeks to come, it's on one hand, it's a little scary, I think, to realize is that we don't have control over very much at all. I mean, we don't have control over society, we don't have control over what we necessarily see on social media or the people that we work with, or even, see, a lot of times we don't even have control over our own selves. And we know, and we're going to, as we'll, we'll look at, is that because of the fall of sin, we see pain and suffering, viewing things differently, and according to Scripture, wrongly. And we live in a sinful and a broken and a fallen world. I think another thing that's helpful is if you were, a couple of years ago now, we, we went through the, the three circles of sharing the gospel with someone. I didn't, and, and the first one was God's design, right? Is that God intended the world to be perfect, to be completely holy. But what happened, it was sin that entered the world. And what I find interesting about the sin that was committed, it wasn't murdering somebody. Really, it wasn't even, I mean, outright breaking the Ten, ten Commandments. No, really, it was a good thing. That was a bad thing. God said, you can have any fruit of any tree in this garden, but... Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Sin entered the world through Adam and Eve because they did not trust God. They didn't trust God. In fact, I mean, I mean that's why they were so easily deceived by, by the, the, the serpent. Satan is that he said, look, I mean, don't you want to be smart? Even maybe even use the language, don't you want to be wise and discerning? <laughs> it was this view of, yeah, but but God said, don't do it. Trust me. And through them, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we see the brokenness, that second part of our circle. World And so we're all striving for, for fulfillment. We're striving for what we had, what we was had back in the Garden of Eden. And sadly, that comes through great pain and suffering. We're all trying to find that utopia, that, you, you, for that, that 
happiness, meaning, and purpose. And we looked at different things to do that. But I'm here to tell you today that if you're looking for fulfillment, satisfaction, meaning, purpose, happiness, or joy in anything other than Jesus, not only will you come up short, but it will likely lead to even more pain, suffering, and ultimately destruction and death. For the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But thankfully, it doesn't stop there. No, the free gift of God free gift is, is Christ Jesus, faith in Jesus our Lord. So our redemption, regardless of who you are, gay or straight or whatever gender you are or you want to be or whatever addiction that you might have or whatever uh, sinful act that consumes you, the only way to satisfaction, the only way to fulfillment and purpose in life is, is, is through Jesus. He came and He lived the perfect, sinless life that you nor I could live. He died, died the death we deserve. But he defeated death on the cross and he defeated our sin by taking that on. And when he rose up from the grave, he said, it is finished. And now he reigns at the right hand of his father and friend. There is a day that he will return. And right now we have time to give your life to him, but we're not promised tomorrow for the Bible says that he will come back like a thief in the night. And when he comes back, you don't have to worry about a Christian judging you, thinking the bad or ill love. You know, he will come and he will be the perfect and the righteous judge. And he will separate those. He will separate the seed sheep from the goats. And he will say, you, my friend, through faith in Christ, you inherit the kingdom of heaven. And he said, you, because of your rebellion, you deserve it eternity in hell. But you don't have to face that condemnation. Oh no, this is a great hymn says, no condemnation now I dread. Oh no, we do not have to, to dread that condemnation for if you give your life to him, if you trust him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength and live for him, then you can have eternal life today. So may today, be the day of your salvation. Hey, if you're watching me right now, it means that you're at the end of this message. And thank you so much for watching. You know, watching or listening to a message online can feel impersonal, but I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is with you right now. And how is He speaking to you? You know, the Bible tells us that we're to not only be hearers of the Word, but we're also to be doers. So, what are you going to do after hearing this message? Maybe you need to trust Jesus as, as your Savior and Lord. You can be saved from your sins through the gospel of Jesus Christ, which simply means the good news, and it truly is good news. God loved you so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to live the perfect sinless life that you could not live. And he died the, the sinner's death that, that you deserve. But he defeated sin and death by rising from the grave on that third day. Are you ready to put your faith and trust in Jesus? If so, would you pray this prayer with me? You'll find the words right here on the screen. Dear God, I am a sinner. And I want to be forgiven. I believe Jesus Christ, your son, died for my sins and is alive right now. I turn away from my sin and now confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and receive him into my life. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to control my life. And I thank you for giving me eternal life. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, every word, would you reach out to me? Maybe you have some questions.
questions about what it looks like to, to follow Jesus, or maybe you have questions about uh, this message, hey, would you get in touch? You can go to our website at cbcmaysville.com forward slash connect. I'd love to connect with you. Again, thank you so much for watching this message, and I would love to see you in person sometime. God bless.